The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received Him, to them He gave them the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Before we get into the Word of God this afternoon, let's all make sure we're in fellowship. 1 John 1, 9 reminds us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's just pause for a second and then we'll go right into our message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity where we can assemble together as believers in Christ. We are fulfilling the mandate in Scripture which says not to forsake the assembling of saints, and that's why we're here. And Father, I pray that if there's anything vying for our attention, that you would assist us in laying those aside so that we can concentrate on thee, concentrate on thy word. And Father, we know how important it is to draw from the scriptures. We know uh, Jesus uh, mentioned in Matthew 4, 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's why we are studying the scriptures. We are going to intake your word with the objective of glorifying thee, with also the results of um, a transformed life as per Romans 12, 2. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are on Acts chapter 1, and what we have been discussing is the promise from Acts 1, 4. And as you'll recall, um, we've been talking for the last several months as far as what we get, and there's just a few more things that I want us to really um, commit to memory, or at least look at. And so the, the last three things we looked at, you'll recall, is that one, um, he convicts and reveals Jesus Christ to men. And who is the he? And the he is referring to God the Holy Spirit. Okay? So when you look at Acts 1-4, he talks about a promise that they would receive. And this promise is in a person. This promise is a person. It's God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus Christ to men. And when you think of the word convict, it has the idea of aid, aiding or assisting, uh, bringing facts to the surface. And you remember in uh, John, uh, we, in, we looked at uh, John 16 where it talks about how he will convict, uh, God the Holy Spirit will convict men of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. Right? Sin because they don't believe. Righteousness because he goes back to the Father and the fact that he goes back to the Father, the fact that he rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, thus proves that he was indeed righteous. And of course, of judgment, namely that Satan was judged on the cross. And so God the Holy Spirit does this through two venue, through avenue, two avenues. And that is one, the Word of God, when a person is exposed to Scripture or the Word of God, then God the Holy Spirit can convict people. This is why it is imperative to open the Bible and show people what the Word says. And, you know, Steve takes the Word of God and he presents it verbatim. So that would be equivalent. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. So it's important that we expose people to truth. And where do we get that truth? The Bible, the scripture, it's not what you think, it's not, you're not trying to debate anybody, you don't have to debate anybody, you just have to point the, the, the spiritual gun at them, or the sword towards them. And the word of God is alive and powerful, it doesn't come back void, it's always going to accomplish what it has purpose. So, he will use the word of God, which is alive and powerful, and what's the other 
uh, way that God the Holy Spirit communicates truth. So he uses the word and he uses you. Right? So you are you're the ambassadors. You are the disciples of Christ. You are the soldiers for Christ. So people are going to come to faith as a result of your interest in them. We can't just count on someone else sharing their faith. God wants and expects each and every one of us to do the work of an evangelist, right? Some people are gifted as an evangelist, but did you know that we're commanded to do the work of an evangelist? Who is supposed to do the work of an evangelist? Us. So although we may not have the gift of an evangelist, you, nevertheless you are commanded by God himself to do the work of an evangelist. Oh, I'm not a good speaker. Well, neither was Moses. It doesn't matter how persuasive your words are. It matters whether, whether or not you're going to transmit the living word of God to the person and that God the Holy Spirit will sink that deep down, in, deep down into their soul. Who does the conversion? Our words or God? It's God. So the sooner we understand the importance of sharing the word, then the sooner people might respond so that they'll pass from death into life. We have the most important job in the entire world. Did you know that? You're the only one that can save someone from the lake of fire. Yes, God ultimately does it. But you have partnered with him at the moment you said yes to Christ. The moment you believed in Jesus Christ. So your position is far more valuable and far more important than anything else in the entire world. Doesn't matter what your profession is. God has used you. God has placed you there. And he wants you to honor him wherever you go. But ultimately, it's not what you do as a career, whether you're at home as a mom or at work as a, uh, working for someone. It doesn't matter what you do. God will allow you to work there as a, an extension of his, the life that he gives. He gives life and life more abundantly. He wants you to impact the people around you, wherever you are. So he's not interested in what you do as far as your career path, but he's interested in what you're doing with Christ. First, do you believe in Jesus Christ for everlasting life? The moment you say yes, good, now you have partnered with him, whether you know it or not. Because now you've been commanded to do the work of an evangelist. You're commanded to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. You're to go out there and pray for more workers. Because God's interest is not in your specialty, but in His. And it's costly. Not on our part, but on His part. He surrendered His Son so that other people can enjoy what you're enjoying. He wants us to be proactive. He wants us to advance the cause of Christ. Doesn't matter if you're a fisherman, as we've clearly seen in the past with his disciples, he can take you and be fishers of men, regardless of your, what you do in life, so that ultimately you will bring him glory. How many of you are interested in bringing him glory? Well, you're going to bring him glory by, as you continue to point people to Christ. You certainly can do things. Uh, you can enjoy your family. You can enjoy a vacation. You can enjoy the friendships and the fellowship. But nothing brings greater joy, from what I can see, than when one person responds to Jesus Christ. We know that if one repents, all the angels rejoice. That's hard to do. One person repents, all of heaven rejoices. What more if a person comes to faith? They're no longer lost. They're found. They're no longer dead. They're alive. Why? Because you took an interest in that person. So he convicts and he uses two things. He uses the word of God and he uses us. We're the vehicles. We're the ones that contain the Bible. A lot of times they don't open their Bibles. They're, they're, you give them a gift, you give them a Bible, there's no guarantee that they're going to read it. And if they read it, there's no guarantee that they're going to understand it. 
right? So we must be there standing in the gap telling people about Christ. And like I've said before, nothing fancy, nothing technical. Just, Jesus loves them. God the Father loves them so much that he allowed his son to go on the cross so that those who would believe in him would have everlasting life. And then after they have passed from death into life, now you can start discipling them. Now you can train them. Now that you can equip them. Uh, what am I going to equip them with? What am I going to train them with? They don't want, even want to go to church. Well, how about life? How about the pressures and the stressors of life? How about what do you do when someone abandons you? Don't commit suicide. Go to Christ. Go to God. There's so much work out there. And Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are so few. And as I pointed out last time, he didn't ask to pray for the harvest. They're ripe. He wants more workers. He said, pray for workers, not for the harvest. And we can certainly contribute to that. So the Holy Spirit convicts. What do we get? Well, we know that he convicts and reveals Jesus Christ to men through the person of God the Holy Spirit. Number two, he restrains sin in the world. As we've seen that right now what we're seeing, ISIS included, all of this is still with God the Holy Spirit having some form of restraint on the evil that's around us. But the moment we are gone and we're raptured out of here and the Holy Spirit is taken away as well, all hell's going to break loose and it's going to be much more intensified. It's not bad right now. It's bad because we, we're looking at what's around us. And like I've said before, in my opinion, the reason why we're getting shocked left and right is because we have access to internet. We have access to global news just by clicking a, a few buttons on the, on the web. But I believe that these things were just as, uh, it, it was just as bad back 2,000 years ago because a lot of the things that we're seeing and a lot of the things that we're reading were written back then. Do you not know that uh, the end, before the end comes, people will be lovers of themselves, disobedient to parents, lovers of money? This was written many, many years ago. This is what they were experiencing during their time. So what we're seeing is everything all at once because we have access to the web. And that's the reason why a lot of people are discouraged. I know people that will not even go out anymore. They just want to stay home. They order all their groceries from the internet and have them delivered and dropped off in the front of their door, in front of the house. It's that bad. And in one of our studies, I said, well, you remember when we used to leave our doors open? You know, so people, we were talking about that and how people used to leave their doors open. It was safe back then in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s. You can't do that today. So you're going to lose something. Someone is going to steal something. Someone will hurt somebody. It's not like that anymore. We have to be guarded and... Um, recognize that the, the world is just spiraling downwards and it's getting worse. And the only way that it's going to change, even just a little bit, is if people respond to Christ. You know, ultimately, it's going to even out when God comes and when He finally... Better, right? huh? It's not going to get better in this age. Not, no, it's not going to get better. But what I'm saying is it could improve a little bit if people, people, yeah, if, if people come to faith. Right? By it, giving them examples of how they can be happy in this world. Or that's right. But the true answer is for their problems, which is the relationship with Christ. Relationship with Jesus Christ, correct. But Very it's good. To get worse. It'll get worse, but I think if we advance the cause of Christ and if people respond in faith, we can, we can improve that segment of where we are or that periphery. I'm not saying that the world is going to become better, it's getting worse. But as it's getting worse, I believe that some people can come to faith. And if people come to faith, then there's some change. And if there's some change, there's room for improvement. If there's room for improvement and we get them discipled, 
then hopefully they're not going to want to steal from you, but they're going to be a good neighbor to you, right? So he restrains sin in the world, and number three, we talked about this as well, he gives life, he regenerates to new life. This is all as a result of the promise. He gives new life. We are born again because of God, the Holy Spirit. So now that takes us to number four. What else does he do? Well, he baptizes into Christ. And we've talked off and on about this baptism and how there are seven baptisms and how there is a ritual baptism and a real baptism. And they must be, you, you have to understand the distinctions between the two. So this one here is what's called a real baptism. But water baptism, when you get dunked under water, that's called a ritual baptism. And that happens when any, every time someone gets baptized. They go, uh, you know, some do it in the church, some do it in uh, Corona Del Mar. So that's a ritual baptism. This is what happens the moment we, we believed in Jesus Christ. For, why, for by one spirit... We were all baptized into what? One body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So notice, by God the Holy Spirit, all were baptized what? Into one body. There's your spirit baptism. Have you been baptized with the Spirit? Yes. yes. But some, in, in some circles, will say, no, you're not. No, you haven't, unless you're speaking in tongues. When you look here, this is what happens in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Where, and of course, you know, as you all know, tongues was uh, relevant during the time of the Corinthian church. But here, Paul says... By one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So this has nothing to do with tongues. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or Greek, whether you're a slave or free. You all have been made to drink into one spirit. So the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit takes every believer and enters him into union with Christ. So this is another uh, positional truth uh, doctrine that we have covered in the past. We're all ba baptized into one body. So that takes place at the moment of faith alone, in Christ alone. The Holy Spirit is the agent that connects us to each other. This is why we call each other brothers and sisters. You can't call each other a brother or sister unless you have been baptized into one body. So the reason why you can call the person next to you your brother or sister is because of this. Because he has taken you and identified you into one body. That's the reason why we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not talking like how people in the streets say, hey, we're bros. It's much deeper than bros. You know, everybody is a bro. You know, all you have to do is be friends or know their name. But this is much more intimate. And because of this, we will always be with him. We will never, ever, ever have to face the lake of fire because we have been baptized through Christ or through the Holy Spirit into one body. It doesn't matter your status. You've all been made to partake in one spirit. That's again, a, that's one of the values of the promise. This is why we're reviewing some of this. This answers the baptism of the Spirit. There isn't a second blessing. When, when do we get this blessing, if we want to call it a blessing? The moment, the moment of belief. So there isn't a second blessing. There's an initial blessing. And which... Uh, of course, it, it comes with other things as well. Some say there's 39 extra things, 41. 
I've cataloged 100, 107 things that occur at the moment of faith. You know, we can call him Father, he is our shepherd, we're in him. There's a number of things, but this is all the result of the promise given to us at the moment of faith. So all believers experience this experience at the moment of faith. Let me repeat, all believers experience this experience at the moment of faith. And this is not something you feel. This is not something that you will send shivers up and down your back. This is a matter of fact. It's stated as such. It's just true whether or not you experience the back of your hair going up or not. This is true. He wants us to know. He wanted the Corinthians to know. And he was reminding them that they were baptized into one body with each other. And this is the church that was falling apart. It was with a lot, of, a lot of sin was taking place. And they were taking each other to court. And he's reminding them at chapter 12 that, hey, you're one family. You are one body. You are connected to the body of Christ. And then he, he talks about how, you know, if the... The hand can't do without the eye, and the eye can't do without the, the foot. We need each other. Those things that seem unnecessary are extremely necessary. So we have people in the local body today, the local church. Some are very vocal, some are not shy. And then there are those who are kind of on the soft side. They, they're they're soft-spoken, they, they're, they're uh, very quiet. But those people are just as important. <coughs> And Paul, and Paul brings it out beautifully. And he says, those things that seem unnecessary are very necessary. It's kind of like, uh, you know, your, the guys, they measure their physique a lot of times with their arms, right? You know, I'm working out, I've got strong arms. And the women, same thing, they look at the beauty on the outside. Paul says, those things that are not seen on the outside are just as important. The way to test this is, how many of you have a kidney? How many of you have a heart? How many of you have lungs? Do you get to see that? Do you get to flex that? Not really. Do you think that's important? Yeah. If you don't have that, you may not live. And if you live, you're going to live at half throttle. Right? So those things that, are not, that seem unnecessary, the ones that are hidden, the ones in the background are very much needed. And there are some here who are soft-spoken and may think that they're not necessary, but don't ever think that. You are extremely necessary. You're very, very important. You, you contribute to the stability of this ministry. A lot of times I'll, I, know, I know that you're, what you're doing is just praying, and that's sufficient. That's a, lot of, that's a lot already. Some people don't even remember to pray. I, rem I think I shared this a few months ago. Um, I... I get this, uh, I get information for pastors and I get these cartoons every so often and the pastor's walking and he says, oh my gosh, there's the Jones family. I promised I was going to pray for them and they're walking closer and so what he does, Lord, I want to pray for the Jones family now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, how you doing? How's everything? I've been praying for you. <laughs> so for those of you who are praying for this ministry, we greatly appreciate it. I especially appreciate it because I know that a lot of what we do is tough as a smaller ministry. But we continue to stand together because we believe that God is honored when we open his word and study it together. And not only just hear it, but we apply it as well. So he baptizes us into Christ and that's the result of the Holy Spirit. And then of course, number five, very important, God the Holy Spirit promotes spiritual maturity. You look at Galatians 3, it says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you or tricked you in, in, so that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law. In other words, did you do something 
Did you obey something in Scripture? Um, and is that how you receive the Spirit of God? Through your act of obedience? Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Or, what's the other one say? By the hearing of faith. Nothing. It has nothing to do with actions. No, it has nothing to do with your works. It has everything to do with faith. And what, what is that? What's he talking about? Receiving God the Holy Spirit. Are we supposed to do good works? Are we supposed to obey the scripture? Yes. But how did we receive the promise? How did we receive God the Holy Spirit? How did we receive the third person of the Trinity? Was it through an act of obedience as far as obeying something in scripture? Or is it through faith? The hearing of faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of God. Where is that found? Romans 10, 17. Very good. Very good. So he's asking the Galatians. He said, who tricked you? He says, are you serious? Let me ask you a pointed question. How did you receive the spirit of God? Was it because of your hard works? Because you were evangelizing? Because you were witnessing? Because you were casting demons out? I don't think so. That's right. Through the hearing of faith. So that's important to know because at least that allows us to see what God has done on His end and then what we, are to do, what, what we ought to do after that. But as far as receiving the Spirit, it has nothing to do with us but simple faith. Okay? He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made what? Epiteleo is the word for perfect. And that it has the idea of being mature. Not that you're ever, ever going to be perfect, but it's the idea of being mature in the faith. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? So Paul answers them just in case they're not tracking. He says, you, you, okay, you started in the Spirit. You've received the Spirit through the hearing of faith. Are you now being made perfect by, by what? Words. What is he saying here? What, what powers do we have within, within the believer? We have the, the struggle between what? Huh? Spirit in the flesh. Are you trying to mature through your own strength? That's the way I would read the last one here. Are you trying to mature through your own strength, through the flesh? You began in the spirit, you did well, because it doesn't start with you anyways. You just believe in Christ and you receive it. Now, are you telling me you're going to be made perfect? You're going to be mature by your own strength? It can't happen. I wonder how many people have looked at this passage like that. It's pretty clear to me, I think, right? Are you so foolish? You've begun in the Spirit. You started off well. But now you're trying to be made perfect perfect by your own strength. Meaning that that's what they were trying to do. You are trying to mature in the faith in your own strength. What have I said here over the, behind the pulpit for the last 10, 15 years? You can't grow apart from the Word of God. You can't mature by trying harder. We have two things that the world, we only have one thing that the world sees. Remember, this is who we are in Christ. This is what's called positional truth. The spirit or the flesh and the flesh and the spirit. Yeah, the spirit and the flesh are at odds with each other, right? The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. So here you are in Christ. In the eyes of God, you are perfect. You are perfect, 100%. Because you have the righteousness of Christ at the moment of faith. This is the reason why we can have this harmonious relationship with a perfect and holy and just God. Because 
when we said, when we believed in Christ, our sins were, remember, our sins have been imputed to him on the cross. One here. When we believe in Christ, what happens? His righteousness is imputed to us. We understand that the sins went back, right? It was very important. Our sins went back to, uh, ultimately was judged on the cross. Our sins were imputed to the body and person of Christ. Did you do that? No. And when you receive that righteousness that comes from Christ, did you do that? No. So the same vehicle that transported all sins, past, present, future, back to Christ is the same vehicle that provides the righteousness in Christ upon the person who believes in Him. So if, let's just say hypothetically, I responded to the gospel this afternoon. Let's say Tess shared Jesus Christ with me and I believed in Jesus Christ this afternoon. His righteousness is imputed to me for the very first time, which allows me to have this harmonious and ongoing relationship with God. He is no longer God to me. He is now my Father. We have been privileged to call Him Father or Abba. So positionally, I start off here. I'm perfect because I have the perfect righteousness of Christ at the moment of faith, correct? But where's my experience? Here. What do you guys see? Do you see this? My position in Christ? Or do you see my experience on a day-to-day -day basis here? This is what you see. This is what you judge. This is what the world judges. So if I'm doing something that's not consistent with Scripture, the world likes to take pot shots and say, Hey, wait, aren't you, aren't you a Christian? So they see this. They don't see this. They don't see my position in Christ. They see my experience in Christ. How about you? Do you see my position in Christ? Do you see my experience in Christ? This is the reason why we're not to be doers on, or hearers only, but doers of the word. We want to guard our testimony. We want to live in a way that would be glorifying to him. It doesn't prove we're saved or lost, but it definitely affects our testimony in Christ. And people either repel or gravitate towards Christ many times by what we do, based on what, what we say or what we do. So here we are. And here we are on a daily basis. I've, said, I've used this example before. Let's say I, had, um, I have a foul mouth. I'm going at uh, 20,000 words a day. I'm using every word in the book, A through Z. Oh, this, that, this, that. Two years from now, you, you see me. We meet up in Starbucks and, oh, this, that, this, and the other. What are you going to conclude based on what you see? Not much growth. Not much growth. But the truth is, I went from 20,000 bad words a day, I'm down to 210. So that's not bad, right? That's making progress. I'm actually, this is moving closer here to who I am in Christ. I'm now starting to look more and more and more like who I am in Christ. But nobody sees that. They only see this. This is why the church is not to judge other believers. We get into this mess, we start gossiping, and then it becomes a problem. Bo, did you ever hear that? <laughs> okay. So it's important to make that distinction. It's important to recognize what we've received. It's important to see that we would be considered foolish if we began in the spirit and we're trying to mature in our own strength, which is a big no-no. How do we mature? Under his influence. We began in the spirit. We should progress in the spirit. And it's always coupled with the word of God. He will never empower us to live apart from God. He will never empower us when we're in sin. But he will empower us when we are in harmony with God. And as we take in his word, we have something to steward. How, how, how are you going to know what to pray for? How are you going to know what to do? How are you going to know what to say? How are you going to make decisions in life 
if you don't know if you don't have a foundation set in place if you're not familiar with the basics of scripture then how are you going to know what to say what to do what decision you're going to make if you don't have the word of god and remember and we'll move to the next point we make decisions every single day and unless we have the word of god as a basis as a foundation if we don't have that set in our soul then we're going to make decisions based on human viewpoint our experiences and human viewpoint more question on that part of the verse verse three you said now being made perfect could perfect be a synonym for sanctified yes definitely that's maturing right so uh, there's three phases of salvation so what phase is sanctification second phase right for uh, phase one is justification phase two is sanctification phase three is up with him glorification saved from the power of sin uh, saved from the penalty of sin saved from the power of sin saved from the presence of sin so very good Morris you could be you could say having begun in the spirit are you now trying to be sanctified by your own strength we're not supposed to but the truth is a lot of people try Steve um, this last week I, I'm trying to, trying to remember but I can't but I just remember that I was talking with somebody mm -hmm. and they were talking about something I was having some problem with something um, something to do with uh, with uh, doing the Gospel of John and mm -hmm. costumes or something like that, trying to get things figured out. And some lady, she said to me, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, that's right, I'd forgotten that. Remember, my mom told me that when I was a little kid, and I forgot that. Thank you for reminding me. And it seems to me that when sometimes when it says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit and I'll be made perfect by the flesh, it says, it says that... Uh, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the Lord or the hearing of faith? So many of us have come to Christ when we were just down and out. Yes. And it's like the, the old kid's story with the lion who finally had to succumb to the little mouse pulling out the, 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 the sticker from the mm -hmm. claw of the, the lion. But yet once the sticker's pulled out, we, we are so down and out, we know by faith that we can only believe in Jesus Christ for eternal life because we have no recent forces of our own. And then we start out on the track of faith because it's sort of a new thing. Yeah. But it's like the lion forgetting that, that <laughs> the foolishness of the little mouse that... Yeah. You know, what I'm saying is we forget what faith really is. It's yeah. faith in the promises of God with, which seem so foolish in and of themselves mm -hmm. that we start going back to our old ways again and start doing it like we used to do when we were an unbeliever. And, and in my case, when I became a believer at 20, you start reverting back to some of the things you did prior to faith but that's why we have to, like faith is a conviction of things hoped for. The, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, seen. like it says in Hebrews. It's a yeah. conviction of things not seen. And that's yeah. what we tend to forget sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Because the promises of God have to be mixed with this concept called faith, which is really right. a very difficult thing sometimes. That's we right. Forget. That's right. We forget that we should have remembered, but we don't. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So true. So, and that's what they were doing here in these uh, foolish Galatians. So they're trying to live by the flesh now. They're trying to mature, or like what uh, Morris said, trying to be sanctified by the flesh. So that's why we champion here the intake of his word. We commit verses to memory. We memorize the promises of God. And remember like two, three weeks ago, we were looking at some of the things that the Holy Spirit provided. And although they were not promises, we were looking at the essence of God that also can impart encouragement when we like for example looked at the sovereignty of God um, we realize that you know if God is really all-powerful and he's on our side if, if God is for us who can be against us that's a form of encouragement that can only come through um, you know going back into the Word of God reviewing the scriptures and knowing the scriptures so we've got the promises of God, we've got the essence of God that we're, we have been looking at together. So we, we really have a lot of things that uh, we can use. These are the resources available to us as believers in Christ. 
So, again, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? And the obvious answer is no way, you can't. And if you're attempting to, then you'll burn out, you'll be frustrated, you'll be bitter, you'll be angry, because it, the spiritual life can't be done in the energy of the flesh. Mark? I agree with what you said by Steve, but I think some churches, they, they preach the gospel, and then, they, then you go back, I mean, it's happened to me, and they, then they preach do's and don'ts. So yeah. I think a young Christian can get really sucked into that system. Yeah, yeah. They don't know the scriptures because it's not being taught to them. That's right. So they're, they walk around thinking they've got to do this, and they've got yeah. to do that, or he's going to yeah. leave me, or, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So true. And, and the, thing, the, the thing that's common today is they'll say, oh yeah, we believe in grace, just you know, believe in Jesus, and we know it's faith alone and Christ alone, but if we don't see any change, see, and uh, that's where it becomes problematic. So it's either grace or no grace. So um, anyways, let's look at number six. So he promises spiritual maturity. What else do we get? Well, he teaches. Isn't that nice to know? He is the ultimate teacher. Uh, the churches around the world, the body of Christ, they all have pastors in the local churches. But it's the Spirit of God that ultimately does the illuminating of truth. And he's the one who teaches and gives understanding. Notice what he said to his disciples when they were still together. But the helper, or in the case of what, where we're at in Acts 1, 4, the promise, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he didn't yet, he will teach you what? All things. And bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Isn't that nice to know? But he's not saying that you don't have to study. And that as you're sleeping, God is going to, through osmosis, give you knowledge of God. He wants us to study the scripture. But it is the helper who will allow us to remember all things. And he will teach us all things because he's ultimately the true teacher. So that's found in John 14, 26. And um, I, I'd also like to add, this does not mean, I see this online, I see this on Facebook, you know, uh, people have not studied for their exam, and so God, the Holy Spirit, is going to bring to remembrance, you know, the things that they've studied for. It would be nice, but uh, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. That's not the right way to use it. Um, number seven, what else does he do? Well, believe it or not, he can influence our prayer life. This is what I've been saying for a while as well. But you, beloved, Jude 20, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, and this is referring to the doctrines or the teachings of Christ, praying in the Holy Spirit, or I take that to mean guided by the Holy Spirit or oriented to, to God. And you find something similar in John 15, uh, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, what does it say? You ask, uh, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. And so sometimes you'll hear people say this. Well, see, all you have to do is abide and you can ask. And they focus on the last half. If you ask anything in my name and they link it with verse 7, You'll ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So let's just have a prayer session. We'll pray for 30 minutes. Pray for a new home, a new car. But is that what it says? It, it doesn't say that at all. What it does say in this verse, John 15, 7, in order for you to get what you desire, what do you have to do? You have to do something. That's a conditional uh, promise here. You have to abide. What does abide mean? Means, it means to stay and remain in his words. So if you, want to, if you want your desire, it must be preceded with staying and abiding in his words, remaining in his word. 
And that's going to influence what you desire. And more than likely, you'll desire what God desires. You know how it is when you, you're, you're in tune with someone, you're in love with someone, you kind, many times you like what they like just because of the, the love between the two. And when you're so in tune with God, when you start abiding in Him and His words, then He says, go ahead, ask what you want. The promise is you can ask, but first abide in me, abide in my words. He's that confident that we would ask things that would line up with his desire. And if you think about it, it makes sense. The more that you're in tune with God, the more that you are abiding in him, the more that you're remaining in him, then your prayer life is going to be influenced. You might be, instead of saying, I want that red Ferrari, you might be thinking, you know, my friend doesn't know you. And I just pray that there's more opportunities for me to share your son. I think that would line up with his desire. That might be my desire after abiding in him and his word. But when you just take the latter half and say, well, guys, God will give us whatever we want. Let's pray now in Jesus' name. We're, we're not being faithful to the text and we're misleading people. And people will go home discouraged, frustrated and angry, wondering why God doesn't love them because they... We're standing on this promise when in fact God is saying um, I never said that I never said I'm going to give you what you want I said I will give you what you want if you abide in me and if you abide in my words two things have to precede your desire abide in me and who's me referring to Jesus and abide in what his word so those two items need to be fulfilled in order for you to get your desire Okay. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done. Abide in Christ and to have his words abide in you is the condition for answered prayer. Let me just cover one last slide and then this is where we will conclude for today. So we can resume with uh, verse 4 next week. Um, or for three, four weeks from now. Next week we'll be at uh, Mason Park. The fact that the Holy Spirit is our helper for these varied ministries demonstrates just how important the Holy Spirit or the promise is to us as believers in Christ. It shows how necessary it is to walk by means of the Spirit, always being, what? Dependent upon Him. Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word and to remind us of how fortunate we are, how blessed we are to have this promise. And uh, we pray, Father, that if there's anybody that we know that has not received the promise, if not received eternal life, that they would respond to Jesus Christ through faith alone in him. Father, if there's anyone here or anyone listening online that does not know you in a personal way, I pray, Father, that they would respond to what Jesus said in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Father, for this time. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hmm? Yeah.